In our next lesson on Chapter 17, Lipid Metabolism, we'll consider the synthesis of other lipids. In previous lessons, we considered the use of fatty acids as fuel. In the process of beta-oxidation, we generated acetyl-CoA that could then feed into the citric acid cycle to, that could give us a large production of ATP for fuel or energy use. Alternatively, we could take the acetyl-CoA and through the process of ketogenesis convert that to ketone bodies, which could also be used as fuel. We might instead, however, of having an immediate energy need, want to store those fatty acids long term and we'll do that in the form of triacylglycerols. We'll start with fatty acid synthesis, but then we need to attach those fatty acid chains to glycerol in order to store them as triacylglycerols. Other than fatty acids and triacylglycerols, we need other types of lipids and this is primarily glycerophospholipids that we need for membranes as well as for signaling as we saw in chapter 10. We'll find that there are three ways that we can make these glycerophospholipids. We may first phosphorylate a head group and then attach it to a glycerol backbone, or we could phosphorylate the backbone and then attach the head group. We could also generate a glycerophospholipid and simply exchange head groups to, to generate a different type of glycerophospholipid. Let's first consider the synthesis of triacylglycerols. We're going to attach fatty acid chains to a glycerol backbone, but we actually start with a phosphorylated backbone. The enzyme glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase reduces dihydroxyacetone phosphate to glycerol 3 phosphate, and this will give us the backbone on which we'll build. Before we can attach those fatty acid chains, they need first to be activated and transferred to coenzyme A in a process identical to that which we saw in the process of beta oxidation. An A and P group is transferred from ATP to the carboxyl group of our fatty acid. We then break the phosphoester bond to form a thioester bond with coenzyme A and that forms our thioester linkage for our fatty acid chain, our activated fatty acid. In this process, we'll release inorganic pyrophosphate, which is then hydrolyzed to two molecules of inorganic phosphate. This will make this whole process irreversible. You'll note that in the cost of fatty acid activation for each fatty acid transferred to coenzyme A, it cost us two molecules of ATP, two ATP equivalents. In other words, two phosphoanhydride bonds. Now that we've activated our acyl chains, we're ready to attach those to our glycerol 3 phosphate backbone, illustrated here. We're going to use acyl transferases to transfer those fatty acid chains from coenzyme A to our free OH groups on glycerol 3 phosphate. We thereby form the intermediate phosphatidate. Next, we'll use a phosphatase to remove that terminal phosphate and generate our third hydroxyl group. To this, we'll then attach our third and last fatty acid chain to form triacylglycerol. This may seem like a rather roundabout way to make a triacylglycerol. Why not start with a glycerol backbone and simply attach three fatty acid chains? Well, in this rather circuitous method, we've generated two intermediates, phosphatidate and diisoglycerol, and each of these can be used as a starting point to make other phospholipids. So let's see how we can do that. In one process, we'll phosphorylate a head group. In our illustration here, we start with ethanolamine or choline head group, we're going to attach a terminal phosphate from ATP to form our phosphohead group. We then activate this molecule by transferring CMP from CTP. Of course, we're releasing inorganic pyrophosphate, which will be hydrolyzed and therefore make this activation process irreversible. We then use diisoglycerol as our backbone and the terminal OH acts as our nucleophile to attack that phospho bond 
and we thereby attach our phosphohead groups to diacylglycerol to form our glycerophospholipid with a concurrent release of CNP. So you'll notice in this case we first phosphorylated the head group and then activated the same molecule carrying the phosphate by transferring CNP. Since we already had that phosphate group, then our backbone has to be an unphosphorylated backbone, in this case diacylglycerol. We could also ex simply exchange a head group. We could start with phosphatidylethanolamine and simply exchange the ethanolamine head group for serine and thereby form phosphatidylserine. In our last method of generating glycerophospholipids, we could start with phosphatidate, our phosphorylated backbone. And we are going to activate this molecule again by transferring CNP from CTP with a concurrent hydrolysis of inorganic pyrophosphate to make this activation irreversible. You'll notice in this case also we activated the molecule already carrying the phosphoryl group and we activated it in the same way by transferring CNP. Now that we have our activated and phosphorylated backbone we're simply going to attach the head group, in this case inositol. So exchange the head group inositol for the release of CNP and there we have our glycerophospholipid phosphatidyl inositol. It's not important you remember the individual details regarding which phospholipid is synthesized by which method, just the general method by which each of these may be generated. In our next video lesson, we want to look at the synthesis of cholesterol and see how it's transported to and from cells.